thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, some example of using C++ templates. That is more audience about C++ here. Um, I'm Afshin Zafari. Uh, late, uh, on March, I graduated my PhD in Uppsala University working on uh, distributed C++ task-based file programming framework. This is part of my research work that I presented in some uh, conferences and I extracted the C++ templates and the uh, works that ha has been done on, on these parts and uh, I will present this to you to, to get a, uh, expert feedback from <laughs> the audiences. Could you please talk a bit louder? A bit louder, yes. That is, is that good? Better. Yeah, better, <laughs> okay. So I uh, partitioned my talk in four pa uh, parts. First of all, I start talking about wha what is task-based programming, in at least in uh, what I work with during the past five years at least, and then go through some frameworks that do this task-based programming and make it much more easier for the programmers, and how can we define or find uh, or propose a unified interface for task-based parallel programming, looking at the existing frameworks. And finally, I go to the C++ template programming and uh, the benefit and advantages of uh, using the C++ templates and uh, uh, what is the real uh, um, results of using this C++ template programming in experiments. So to start with, I in a very short uh, example of what is a task in, in, in the definition. First of all, we, we want to call a function asynchronously and then waiting for its finish to, to get the results of the task or the function that we call it asynchronously. Here I found a very simple example uh, in C++ uh, syntax that the sum of a line vector of 10,000, for example, elements of type int, and calling a parallel sum function, which in, in inside the function, uh, <coughs> the asynchronous call, if I can use this pointer <laughs> instead of, <laughs> and the asynchronous call called the parallel sum I itself, but uh, we, we know that there is a future handle here, automatic handle, the result of the asynchronous call, and getting the result of the asynchronous call this is the synchronization points for the asynchronous functions that are called. So the, the asynchronous here uh, gives us the opportunity to call or initiate the execution of some tasks that are independent in terms of uh, different partitions of the array of size 1000 here. We, we call recursively the parallel sum until the size is less than 1,000 and then accumulate from the begin and end uh, positions in the array. So this is uh, two points here that we asynchronously call as sum functions and then waiting for the results by using this uh, get uh, method from a future object. But uh, the problem here is that this is a simple function, one function, and single result value. Uh, the question is if we have a hundred or thousands of these function calls, uh, how can we handle the output and how we, we can find the, the da data output of one function for data input of the other function or to the one task to the other task. So it, it's getting hard for the programmer to, to synchronize every single task, every pair of tasks in terms of their input output and, uh, and sometimes it may not be possible even to do this thing. So this asynchronous call and synchronization is the point that <coughs> uh, the task-based for parallel frameworks are uh, trying to make it much more easier uh, while preserving the performance and the <coughs> parallel pro execution of the uh, tasks. So <coughs> having this in mind, uh, I can go one step further that most of the frameworks uh, use this new approach of uh, finding task dependencies as, mm, mm, as automatic as possible. 
So they move, instead of saying that task X is depending on task Y, we, the, the, the frameworks look at the task to data dependencies. I say that some summing of uh, elements of the vector uh, is depending to the elements of the vector or the, to the partitions of the vectors, not to the previous task or other uh, types of tasks. So uh, by, by this new approach, the dependency description in terms of task to data, uh, the framework can extract the dependencies, uh, can, uh, can find the dependencies at runtime without uh, getting much more information from the programmer, and then they can uh, schedule and find some, uh, the, the they can resolve the dependencies when a task is ready to run in terms of their input and their dependency to the input data and output data. Uh, I give this, uh, three, these three examples of frameworks, of task-based frameworks that uh, kind of task-based, we can say, because they have some asynchronous uh, uh, calling mechanism for functions, but uh, we see that they are from Google, Microsoft, Intel, but none of them, uh, you know, or uh, we can say all of them require the programmer to define these dependencies. If I r want to write a TensorFlow program for any, any type of application, machine learning, whatever, I should say that first this task should be done and then after that to the other task. But they can run in parallel in background, but the dependency graph between tasks should be created by the programmer himself or herself. So this is the same for micro Microsoft TPL and also Intel TBB. There is no mechanism in the, in the frameworks that the framework itself can extract the dependencies without uh, requiring the programmer to, to explicitly talk about this. So this automatic extraction is done by, by this frameworks that I will go through them very, very fast and as an overview uh, from different uh, research groups in different universities. And I will show some examples of how do they work. Then we go to the next step, how can we uh, um, find some common things among these old frameworks and make it in, in a prepare a, for a unified interface for programming task-based program. So let's go to the next. <coughs> uh, first, I start with the OMPSS, which is an extension of OMP, OpenMP, uh, from Barcelona Supercomputer. This is, uh, we, we can add <coughs> number pragma OMP task, which, uh, the, the, which do exist in, <coughs> in OpenMP 3 and later, and we can add this, the extension to this is that we can add the in out argument to this pragma that says that the A, for example, in this uh, slide is uh, partitioned in, in two dimensions by TS times TS. This is the information that we give to the compiler that the input A for the void function OMP port RF function is uh, partitioned into this number of tiles and the leading dimension is, is the third parameter. That's one thing. And for the next one, for example, the, the other function has uh, <coughs> an input only one, uh, mm, data A with the same uh, partitioning uh, dimensions and there's an in out B. So we can tell the compiler that the data that some function are used are <coughs> used for only input, only output or both input and output. And then we define them as task, which means that when we use this, uh, we, when we call these functions or invoke the functions in our program, it, they should be run asynchronously and in the background, the compiler will produce the code for a, a scheduling and uh, uh, running them in a uh, consistent way regarding this in and out data how do they use this <coughs> data uh, in different uh, invocation calls. Here is a function, a, is a routine Cholesky blocked with two input of a number of tile sizes and uh, each, uh <coughs> each uh, number of elements per each uh, tile. And the, the input matrix of two dimensional <coughs> 
mt by mt. So in four nested loops, we call these three functions or these two functions of uh, task defined with, with the input uh, and the indexing is used for for the partitions of the metrics with the two, two other parameters and so on. We go to the next function call and for this also there are some uh, declaration about uh, how they use the input arguments uh, uh, as input data or output. So, and at the end we, we wait for all the tasks because they are called asynchronously. We just wait for all of them to finish to return back from the function. So with, with this information of input or output data for any function, we can call them uh, asynchronously and then in the back end the frameworks can construct the dependency graph and uh, traverse the graph whenever a task is executed or finished and then trigger other tasks to run if they are uh, mm, if the, the u their use of data is consistent in terms of input output so <coughs> here the compiler can do hierarchical partitioning for us in in this OMPSS and uh, there is a <coughs> Um, version for distributed names cluster SS, which is the same, but uh, the hierarchical partitioning of the data can be done for distributed nodes, distributed processors, and the ownership of the data can also be done externally uh, by the runtime uh, parameters. But the problem with the open OMPSS is that only one process is going to uh, construct this task graph and uh, distribute the task for all other nodes. This cent centralized uh, work is uh, kind of a bottleneck uh, for um, e scalability because when we expand uh, the number of nodes from 1 to 10, 10 to 100, then the, uh, it is not possible, uh, it is not as fast as uh, other non-centralized works uh, to to distribute this task for for other nodes, so this is about the OMPSS. Uh, sorry. Yep. Yep. Uh, what's the typical size of the, the matrices? It is. Uh, our, yeah. The in the real problems, it it should any program should be able to run uh, about million elements per million mm -hmm. dense matrices. Yeah. That's. I, I will show you that. Maybe I will talk later that. Uh, one of the assumptions about the tasks or the task-based power programming is that the tasks themselves are uh, computing, compute demanding enough, I, I can say. They, the kernels of the task, the body of the functions are uh, compute intensive enough to, to, to amortize the overhead of this scheduling and traversing the graph and so on. Yeah. So this is for large datums, yeah. Uh, especially my work is in distributed environments where we talk about hundreds of nodes that are going to solve a single problem or factorize a single matrix uh, all together. So uh, the, the size of the matrices are too huge. Um, the next framework, <coughs> some similar with that. Uh, uh, the STARPU from the Bordeaux University and the INRIA Research Group. Uh, this uh, star here can uh, be used both as compiler directives like OMPSS and also calling APIs using their libraries. Here there are explicit data registration uh, that we define that uh, the corresponding to this matrix XY there are some data handles and then we asynchronously insert tasks in a distributed way using MPI and use those data handles as read or read write access for this function name, whatever it is. And there are some nested loops to uh, asynchronously insert this task to the, to the graph, we can say. So, <coughs> and also the waiting at the end for all the tasks and all the communication to be done. Uh, what, what are common here is that we define some data to the framework, then use them as an, uh, with the input output annotation kind of, and call 
a task or some task in a serverless way and waiting at the end. Uh, here, Star PO do this in a decentralized way. All the nodes that are running the program are contributing to 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 run all, uh, the whole this uh, part of program, for example. And uh, by the data ownership, they every task and every processor knows that because the, the, it owns, for example, mm, data handles of IJ, then this specific task should be run on the processor that owns the data and so on. So all the processors read the task, uh, insert them to the graph, and they run their own allocated uh, or uh, own assigned <coughs> task uh, and then distribute the, the data transparently in the back background without writing any, any specific thing from the uh, programmer. So, uh, and, uh, but the problem here is that the hierarchical partitioning of the data for large data is not possible in StarPew. The data is looked at uh, as, as a uh, flat large data, and there's no partitioning for that. So that could be a problem again uh, against uh, for, for <coughs> scaling the performance. And next <coughs> um, framework is Parsec from University of Tennessee. Uh, the algorithm or the, the functions or whatever we want to make it parallel and, in, and run it in distributed way uh, is written in, in a scripting uh, language like this, but the same uh, approach is used. The function call here, the function name is this. Input and output with the left arrow. This is the function call in the for loop of k K indexing for the partitions, and different functions are called with input and output, and some uh, input and output may, may be in common. So some parameters are used both for input output, and so on for the rest of the script. And when the script is written, then it can be processed by <coughs> some other uh, yeah, post-processor scripting uh, things from PASIC that uh, converted to a uh, C code, uh, and the task and data from the script are ex ex extracted. Then the graph is constructed by the, by the utility, and the optimal scheduling for, for a specific task can be found offline, <coughs> and the, the solution, the, the optimal solution is embedded, uh, it's written in C code that can be embedded in our project. Uh, for compilation and uh, uh, linking uh, later. And <coughs> here, uh, PASIC used yeah, uh, both hierarchical <coughs> and also decentralized uh, way of task distribution and <coughs> execution. But the problem is uh, here, or the difference here is that the scripting language should be used for defining the algorithms. And the next one is uh, Superglue from Uppsala University, TDB group that uh, I was working for. This is a C++ header-only library, but for shared memory, multi-core systems. Again, the syntax or the, the approach is the same. We use uh, a, a class of task, inherited from tasks, <coughs> and then a new instance of this type of task are submitted to, <coughs> thank you, uh, to, to, to the framework, the superglue itself. And when the task is ready to run, uh, then the run method of this class will be called by the framework itself. So this is the Hello World example of such a C++ uh, library. And to have more <coughs> detail about these things, uh, now, a more kind of advanced uh, example is that uh, we are going to uh, scale a vector of numbers and then sum, sum of them together by, by these four lines. Uh, these are the tasks. These are the data parameters of, of the two, two tasks. We make new instances, submit to the <coughs> Uh, Superglue 
framework and then wait for all the tasks to finish, then we can use the output data here. And here we, we see that there are an array of handles, H, that will be passed to the uh, task constructors that uh, they, they represent the data that the tasks are using for input or output. Um, <coughs> so it is very similar to the other ones. And the scale task itself is inherited from task. And the constructor receives some pointers to double and also references to handle data types. And here the API from the uh, superglue uh, register the access to the handle A as a read or handle B as a write. Or it is also possible to have some other uh, types of using the parameters. And at the run method of the class, we just do the actual computation on the uh, A and B parameter uh, <coughs> member variables that already initialized at the startup, uh, at construction. So this is the same <coughs> for some of uh, different parts of a vector receiving uh, three handles, registering the first two as read and writing the result to the third parameter, first to read and then writing to that one. And also we, 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 we can see that uh, using handles for re representing data, then introduce them as input or output for tasks and a kernel for, uh, for running when a task is ready to run by the framework is the common things that uh, um, can happen for in, in task-based frameworks. And the next uh, and the last uh, framework that I will talk is DocTech, again from our research group in Uppsala University. This is an example, again, very simple example one that uh, <coughs> we can define data types of different dimensions for because of uh, the duct that is distributed <coughs> for distributed memory system, then we can define a process grid of uh, the grids that, uh, the, the processes that we are running the program on them. And we can partition data in different ways, in different numbers. And here, again, we submit to the duct tape <coughs> framework, uh, new instances of some tasks with two parameters that the first one is read and the second one is read write. And then at the end, we at the finalized, um, after the calling the finals of the dark tape, then we can use the output in this example that uh, the output are ready to use. And all the other um, synchronizations, parallel executions, and the background the, uh, communications, all of them are, are, are done by the frameworks themselves. And the, the user has to define some uh, classes inherited from some task base, base classes and uh, defining the data, partitioning it in some way, and then using the, uh, or uh, submitting some instances of the tasks uh, to the framework and then wait for finish. That, that's the whole thing that uh, a programmer should do uh, in using these types of uh, frameworks. <coughs> so, so far we, we have seen that there are, uh, uh, there are many things in common and some differences between the, the frameworks. But the point here is that not a single framework is the winner in terms of performance or uh, productivity or uh, yeah the language. Uh, some of them, uh, they are there is no single uh, framework for working with shared memory distributed on GPUs. If there is such a framework, then the performance is not uh, the winner. Some uh, di performance differences come from this centralized or decentralized approach or for hierarchical or flat data. And uh, you saw that uh, there are some scripting languages, compiler directives, <laughs> and 
using libraries or header only. There are different ways of using these frameworks. But what is common among all of this is that first we, we can talk about data that we are going to use in, in data in task arguments. We define data, we can partition the data. We can say that uh, who is owner in terms of which process or which node, which computing node is the owner of the uh, data, any piece of data, and uh, what is the real memory that the data points to, and the real data is being uh, held in which part of memory in the system. And for the task, we can define uh, what are the input, output, or arguments, how many arguments do they need. And we define them uh, in, in such types of uh, classes or whatever. And the kernels that the actual computation is done, uh, we, we can, or we have to define some kernels for every task that we want to schedule and run by the framework. <coughs> and the framework responsibility or uh, contribution to this work is that we want from the framework to, to, to have some APIs to submit tasks in an asynchronous way and the framework we expect from framework to notify us when the when a task is ready how 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 the framework notifies us calling a specific method of a class or a callback function whatever and when a task is finished whether we say to the framework that this task is now finished and you can uh, go through the task graph and find the other task and the other way around that, uh, the framework can notify us that now some task is finished, whatever you want to do, do it. So these things, these common things from common bet between data, task, and framework uh, gives the chance to define and propose a unified interface for programming task-based parallel uh, frameworks or programs. Uh, in terms of some generic definition or generic uh, types of data, task, and framework. And this unified interface is, uh, is going to, uh, yeah, to, to bring a lot of benefits that I, I will uh, go through them in later slides. So <coughs> this is uh, the, the f if the programming uh, of uh, parallel resources uh, is divided into these three levels, three different uh, levels. In at the top layer is the application layer that the programmer, uh, the end user, who writes the program, and at the bottom uh, is the is is the frameworks, and at the technical layer, this is the way that the unified interface I, I wanted to talk about. So the, this type of unified inter interface uh, allows the programmer to write in terms of this interface. And at the uh, back end, we, we can uh, every different uh, <coughs> framework can uh, implement that interface and provide the functionality of the framework to the end user at the top layer. So with this unified interface, the program is decoupled from this layer. So I can write the program uh, in terms of this unified interface. And uh, it, it doesn't matter whether it will be run by duct tape, by Starpew, by Parsec, by <coughs> Superglue, or other frameworks. And yeah, different configuration of different frameworks can be also mixed. <coughs> To, to enable a program to run in different uh, uh, parallel environment. In, for example, I implemented uh, some wrappers around existing frameworks like duct tape, Starpew, and Superglue for that complying this interface for generic tasks, generic data, and uh, framework. Uh, we, we have seen that duct tape is for distributed only, Starpew multi-core and GPU and some <coughs> support for distributed but not high performing in this area. Superglue is <coughs> good for or is, is developed for uh, multi-core systems and 
if you know that uh, the, there is a library for linear algebra, GLOSS is the acronym for it, Basic Linear Algebra Subroutines. And these libraries are uh, available for both GPU, for QDOS-GPU, QDOS. And uh, <coughs> I write a wrapper around this um, and make it, uh, make the GLOSS library, both on single CPU and GPUs, available to this interface. So with, with this, five wrappers, <coughs> I can write a program at top layer using the interface, submit the task for my program, and at the next level that, that this interface, we can configure the interface that use, for example, only CPU wrapper. All the tasks that are coming from the program are dispatched to the CPU plus, which means which result in running the program in a single CPU code. Mm, configuration and if I use both these two super glue and CPU plus for example for the same program for the same task submission whatever it is uh, the, the tasks that are coming to, to this dispatcher are first go to the super glue for multi mm, for shared memory multi-core systems scheduling and when they are ready to run they notify the dispatcher uh, as a as a uh, <coughs> protocol in the interface that some tasks are ready to run. Then the dispatcher can forward this ready to run to this, uh, to the next or to, to the yeah, next level of uh, scheduler with, with this interface and then they will be run actually on this uh, different CPUs in parallel. So by mixing these two, I can run the program in multi-core uh, CPU environments <coughs> and <coughs> if I bring in also this framework I can run <coughs> the tasks that are uh, submitted to dispatcher can be run on GPU or on uh, multi-core CPU or single CPU with uh, <coughs> this forwarding uh, mm, task submission and task ready to run and task finished between these frameworks. So the unified interface here allows us to decouple the program from the frameworks and it uh, gives a unified interface for define for uh, if any um, of these frameworks uh, comply this interface then they can co uh, co cooperate with each other uh, through the dispatcher in, in between. So these <coughs> uh, advantages of uh, user uh, unified interface is <coughs> uh, tested against uh, in real cases as I already showed that the we can imagine that the program dispatcher and framework different configuration can construct a graph of task flow that the task start uh, flowing from program, then to dispatcher, then dispatcher uh, forwards them to one of the available frameworks, and then the notifications from the frameworks will be uh, forwarded to <coughs> other uh, frameworks. So in this graph, uh, the nodes are program, dispatcher, and different frameworks, and the edges are the flow of the the task themselves and also the notifications. So this is some type of the graphs that I already showed in this, uh, the previous slide that this graph is for one CPU task from program uh, coming to dispatcher or forwarded to one CPU framework. It, they can be forwarded to N CPU framework, for example, super glue, and then every task that is ready to run here can be forwarded to this framework and so on for NCPU framework like a star pew. This is for the same uh, environment, uh, NCPU, and it's it we can join the <coughs> CPU, GPU, and at the end of the graph of, um, forks to, to different frameworks. And also we can use distributed uh, framework like duct tape and whenever a task is ready at uh, duct tape level, then we can 
forward the task to the star view at the next to yeah, break it down into some other task within every node. And then every task uh, that gets ready here can be run by single CPU uh, with the one CPU framework, for example. So this is the graph view of what I uh, showed in the previous slide. <coughs> and this is the real execution of these configurations from C1 to C6. This is the size of the matrices and the application is here Cholesky factorization of a matrix A that they factorize the A into multiplication of a lower triangle and its transpose. Uh, the matrix is dense with this size. All elements are non-zero kind of. And different frameworks with different uh, <coughs> configuration are used for this for for running the single application that its code is written once that's the point I write the Cholesky factorization in in uh, using this unified interface I, I abbreviate it as unified task programming UTP I write the program in terms of UTP interface call ta task definition and uh, input output data and partitioning and so on and then I can link my code with, with different uh, libraries that configured by different frameworks. Here is uh, the star view with CPU only, <coughs> without, without UTP. The, the real application of a star view with CPU only gives us this, this amount of performance. The, the vertical axis is the number of trough flops for, for the size of the matrices that the chip. And for for the system that this experiment has run, uh, the, the maximum was one truffle up <coughs> per node. And uh, there are 20, um, I forgot the processor type. There are 20 cores here in each node. And in this C1 configuration, I can also use the same star view with CPU plus, plus library for one CPU case and I can get much more better performance in, uh, because of the, for example, the memory allocation and the partitioning and hierarchical things that, ha that is uh, already available in UTP, Unified Interface Programming. And if I change star view to super glue, oh, it doesn't matter why it, it is better. I, I'm trying to focus on that as an end user, I have a program and I want to run it in as mm, fast as possible. And my opportunities are star view and super glue. But, but they, they have, we have seen that they have different uh, style of programming. One is C++ and the other one is C or uh, compiler extension for C. So this is my choice of uh, moving from one framework to another and getting better results. That, that's the choice that I have as a programmer with, with a program in hand. And uh, we can see that since the node is limited to do further after this metric size of 30,000 per, per dimension, so the GPU can also be used by adding, uh, in the UTP, adding GPU Q plus also together with the star view, and to have a comparison between <coughs> uh, using it UTP or not, uh, we, the C4 is, is this sign line, the original one without UTP, after 30,000 using the GP, GPU is, yeah, make, make it enable to process this size of input. And for the C, C5, we, the the solid line shows that uh, it is not possible to go much further after this size. But uh, again, as an end user, I have also the opportunity to use duct tape to add, for example, hierarchical data partitioning and get the same <coughs> result as star view without or, uh, UTP. So uh, the unified interface, uh, the, as to make it short, give, give me as 
um, as the end program at the possibility to mix different frameworks together uh, without changing my software, without changing my program. If I have already a legacy software of thousands of functions, then it's not needed to rewrite them again for uh, using StarPew or using SuperGuru or any other framework. At, and at the same time, I have the possibility to mix them in terms of GPU, CPU, and distributed. So this, this is the <coughs> point behind the unified interface. And the main uh, restriction or the main condition that this type of interface should uh, have is uh, that the, the, the performance should not be uh, degraded by using this generic interface. Uh, to be explicit in C++ or in other uh, languages, if we define a, a pure virtual functions for I interfaces, then use this type of uh, dynamic binding or <coughs> uh, inter generic interfaces, then uh, the performance penalty is too high because the l there are large number of partitions here, for, for example, for this program. And Every mm, every single function call, if it is virtual or not, it, it has a great bottleneck because around million times of uh, th those tasks are called in one <coughs> run of this application. Since the, there are these many tasks calling, then the task invocation cannot be done in in terms of virtual or dynamic binding. So the first solution or the the topic of my uh, talk here is <coughs> how can we use template programming for a static binding to, to implement such an interface. So to go to next uh, is I, I try to summarize this uh, templates of the program that I've written for, for implementing the uh, unified interface itself. And um, we can here, for example, say, see that this is the dispatcher type, a short version of. And for different configuration of, of uh, the frameworks, uh, there are yeah, conditional switches for compilation. Here, the dispatcher is defined either as a node dispatch of a single node for <coughs> for QWS or CPU BLAS for one CPU. There is only one CPU uh, in, the, in the task flow graph. There is only one node after dispatcher to task to be sent to. And we, for the other cases that we have two, <coughs> or if we want to <coughs> implement the <coughs> task graph, task flow graph, we need to have edge with edge, we connect two different uh, frameworks together. For example, SuperGuru and BLOSS construct an edge, and then dispatcher is, a, is an edge dispatch type that we will, I will show you what, what was it. And so on for the distributed and, uh, and uh, single CPU frameworks. And for the cases, there are more than two nodes for a single configuration, we, we use the path dispatch, which constructs of two types of edges. The first edge is duct tape to super glue, and then super glue to BLOSS, which this tree construct a path that the ready task from distributed tasks forwarded and uh, um, partition and forwarded to multi-core system frameworks and so on when when a single task is ready at this level then we uh, forward the task to run at the plus level and so on for the other edge and path dispatch configuration of the dispatcher so this type definitions are done uh, for constructing the dispatcher type and the single node and edge are defined generically in a, in a generic way to contain either single node contains only a type named first to better referencing for the further code or 
an edge uh, from T and U types, <coughs> construct a type named as first and second. And uh, for dispatching, for example, for node dispatch means that there is a single node uh, that we are going to, the dispatcher is defined uh, as a type of node dispatch of, for example, single node of BLOS. So we use the first type of the input parameter E in the node dispatch. And here, for example, when we, when the framework gets uh, ready from the first, uh, here all, all the methods from the dispatcher, the first parameter is, is the color of the function that we, from the type of the color we can find uh, mm, the, the origin of the flow from tasks <coughs> or mm, function calls. So all the methods are static of the type, so there is no dynamic binding here. And when, for example, program call this task submit from dispatcher and uh, give, given a task input instance, and we just forward it to the edge uh, element first submit static method of this given type and give this T to this uh, submit. And when the T gets ready, this function, this static function will be called. And uh, since this comes from first, we can run immediately the task uh, that is the parameter. <coughs> so this is uh, one way to distinguish from where the tasks are coming and using the <coughs> a static function calls uh, for getting, uh, getting rid of the virtual uh, and dynamic binding. So next is the edge that the first and the second <coughs> type of the edge are defined as first and second. Again, uh, tasks that are coming from program are submitted to the first. And when they get ready, they will be run. And for since we have edge, then it is possible that uh, some task in the middle node are split and partition again. So it is possible to, to receive task by calling the submit from the first level then it is easy to call the task for the second level. Uh, this is yeah very, very short uh, <coughs> version of the dispatcher. But the idea is, is this, that you first using the first parameter for, for the color and then using the static method calls to with, with required uh, task types of to T and P. Um, I can, if, if there is a question, I can answer it later, but, um, <coughs> and here, uh, for the, f when we have an edge, if a task is finished, then we can call the first node in the task graph that this specific task is finished, and where, uh, at the finest level, in the edge, there are three nodes, and, uh, or, or two nodes after this uh, dispatcher. If the second node says that some task is finished, we look at the number of uh, children in the task <coughs> parent, and then if all the child are done, then we can call the, 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 the first level framework that some task is finished. So this hierarchical task execution and finishing and scheduling can be controlled in this way, in static way, more importantly, I can say. And also it is possible to, and uh, uh, yeah, to control the parent-children tasks. And here we see that this is an atomic decrease of the child call, as in, uh, it, it can be called by different threads from different task finished but the parent uh, child count is a single uh, variable that to be decreased in a 
atomic ray. Mm -hmm. And for the path dispatch, we have three elements or three nodes. Uh, E1 and E2 are uh, two edges that they are connecting one after another. And we make different first and second of the E1 and the second of E2 is the third. We have three different nodes that the tasks should be fl flowed between them. Um, submit task submission from uh, from the first one or go to the second and from the second one goes to the uh, last e2 second is e2 second is, is the last note and when they get ready for the first for example we can uh, as an example I show that uh, we can call the specific method of the task. Here I split the task itself into subtasks. When it is ready at the second level, we can run it, for example, and so on. And at the finish part, I start from the last node to the first one. If at the third level we have a task finish, we check at whether the trials are finished as well or not. Then we call the finish of the parent task at the second level, which comes here. That's maybe some other framework. And also, if the finish of the second level, or uh, if the all, all the trials at the second level are done, then we call the finish back at the first level. So this is <coughs> some way of uh, hierarchical task uh, notification of finishing or getting ready by this dispatcher to different frameworks. And as an example, uh, let me go back to dispatch definition. Here are the first and second things that we have talked about that uh, they are uh, wrappers around existing frameworks. So the dispatcher is the same, is written once. It can be used with different frameworks, and it can connect different uh, frameworks together. Here, I, I just do some hierarchical uh, task flow. So as a conclusion, <coughs> yeah, using this unified interface program can written once, as I emphasize it, in terms of generic tasks and data. And different frameworks can cooperate together without knowing each other. Uh, SuperGlue and StarPew, they are working together. Some tasks are scheduled by StarPew when they get ready to run. They will run by SuperGlue, for example. But neither of these two frameworks know about, mm, doesn't know about these uh, tasks or uh, task structures of uh, the other framework. They just know this generic task or the unified interface. And programs are decoupled from frameworks. That's a good achievement. And uh, yeah, I, I told about this. And this is good to know the, to have this unified interface <coughs> helps us to for migrating of legacy software. We have a code uh, source uh, code bank of a thousand lines, for example, and then. Uh, when we want to go from CPU to GPU, then we have to rewrite them a lot. But this migration is can be done by low cost uh, if we have some complying framework over the uh, GPU. Then we can just um, uh, make a wrapper around the wrap, uh, framework and then link our programs with, with this new uh, wrapper. And if some some, for example, if Q loss is, is going to change for some new GPU devices, then it is easy to, or it is, it is enough to change the wrapper around the GPU framework, and our program will benefit from this new things um, implicitly, kind of, and no need to change the program for getting benefit of these new techniques or technologies. And for all of this, the C++ template programming uh, makes it uh, mm, enable to, to keep the performance when we add this extra 
for uh, task flow stuff in, in between the program and the frameworks. And this is thanks to the yeah, static binding of the function calls that may happen million times or during run time. Yeah, here uh, it finishes my talk at this time. And uh, questions, if. <laughs> Thank you.